Hi everyone, this is your chess puzzler and welcome to the channel. The 2018 candidate is now in his sixth round and though some games were on the slow side of things, others had not been at all slow. I know many people say games are very interesting when there is a win and if it ends in a draw, it may be classified as boring. Well, if you are one who believes Drawing games are boring. Have I got news for you? This is Aronian's game against Kritschuk. I will leave history aside and just concentrate on the game. Before I do this, one thing though. At this level of play, would you think White has the advantage? Kasparov used to say if he started with the white pieces, he would at least be able to guarantee a draw. In fact, in this tournament... There have been more wins with the black pieces rather than white. In round four, Levon had lost his game against Kramnik in probably his worst game ever. Today, he's going to try and do things right. So Aronian got started with the white pieces. Levon loves his English openings, but today he went for a d4 start. The response was knight f6. And then we saw c4. And now g6. That c4 always comes in when Levon plays with white. It's like MVO going for c5 when he has black. Kasparov made his career on this type of move, but let's not bring Kasparov into the game anymore. After f3, Richard responded with c5. And the idea of this move is to allow white to take, and the result is that his efforts to control the center are going to fail. Aronian pushed on with d5. And what this d5 does, for now at least, is to stop the queen side knight from gaining access to c6 until this guy on d5 is gone or the knight finds another way of coming into the game. Richuk responded with d6. And now the knight will find the opportunity to come out, probably using this spot on d7. before he is able to become useful. Aronian went for e4. And for now, the center is his. Richard attacked d5, with the aim, of course, to break up White's control of the center. Knight c3 got these guys off the board. And now when the bishop came out on the diagonal, Aronian went for this very interesting knight move. Sticking the knight on e2, it's not a usual move, but you need to be thinking what is next. So I can only guess this knight came here only as a precautionary or defensive move, if you like, to cover his twin brother on c3. Grishuk also came up with a knight move, which is far better because he has far more flexibility than any other knight. He has e5 and b6. Aronian went for his second consecutive knight move, and now I have no idea where else he can go next. Grichuk sussed out a probable h4 and didn't even give Levon a chance. He got h5 in with ideas of going after this knight. Bishop e2 got the knight rerouted, and now for this bishop move, attacking d6. It was any response to cover. We know queen move to c7 is going to backfire as this runs into this knight attack. And if you have any funny ideas of coming in with a check, I don't know. Haven't thought about this one yet. Probably returning the bishop to attack the queen does it nicely. Moving out the king to f1 is also a very good option. Hold on. There is another attack on the queen. And how could I miss it? B4. And now, we, <clears throat> and now we are in business because if you take with a fresh check, the bishop will return. And once he comes attacking, is the queen gone? No, she has B2. But even here, black is busted. There is always a nice check on C7. 
and the rook is gone, but what if we attack the queen? Take a2, and then we can be sure black is messing around with his lady. This bishop attack has to be the most powerful moves. Because the queen has to go now. Best to take the rook because if you take this bishop, why do you think this knight is here? d6 becomes now the hot spot and is now the turn of the big lady to retire. Coming back, this is why Grichuk didn't want to get his queen into unfamiliar territory. He covered by placing her here. When queen d2 materialised, we knew Aronian is looking to go for long or not. Maybe this queen move here is to cover b2 when this knight makes his way out of this spot. But let's not forget what is going on on the other side of the board. Grigio came up with an excellent attack on the knight and there is no player on the planet who is not going to go and get his knight back to safety. So back to f1 it was. And since Grichuk was on the attack, he went on and pursued this bishop too. And again, there is one spot you can be looking at, e3. Knight e5 was spot on. And though Ronian has full control of the white squares, his position is a bit crammed. Levon went for g3 to open up the position, but Grichuk waited here. He went for this bishop move, a move that allows him to choose what side to castle. When these little soldiers were removed here, the position is already getting very complex. He got the rook active, leaving f5 to materialise. The attack on the knight led to him coming close into the action. So, what does white go for here? Whatever you do, do you prepare to exchange pieces? The party started when e5 came in. e5 was immediately eliminated. But there might be just another way to do it here. I'm not going to go through this variation, but then again, I'm thinking if I don't cover it, I will be saying, why on earth I didn't? So, let's try it. What the heck? What about if we take with the knight? Once this knight is removed, or slightly stronger, we can remove the bishop first. The knight can then squeeze in with a check. And now when he's recaptured, the rook can now come off. And what do we have here? And sorry guys, this does not work because white is better off as a result of this variation. Okay, let's return. At least we tried it. Having taken e5, got the queen attacked. Queen e6, got the knight to come up the board. And this is the way Levon did it. He went for b5. But could d5 be better? You probably worried about the queen taking. But if the rook lines up behind the queen, I think white is still better. So knight to b5 it was. With ideas of coming in with a check on c7. Unless Grishuk castles. He didn't. And by bringing his rook to cover... Levon was very happy to see this. He came with a check and he now decides to hand over the rook for the knight. f4 is now removed. But if you recapture, we would have a situation. A very difficult situation. It is very easy to sit back and just watch the moves come out. But try them yourself. What on earth do you do here? Do you take f4? Or do you take the knight? Or do you go and remove c5? When the game ended, there was a lot of talk about this position. Grichuk's thoughts here, I'm not sure exactly how he said it, but he might have said he was neutral. Levon said his position was not very strong and was probably losing. When he was advised that long castles was the only move he was looking for, giving him a plus three score. He was extremely surprised because he himself was with the impression that he was losing. It is in fact a very interesting variation because if you do castle, once you allow the bishop to drop, 
when the knight recaptures, you can always try the pin on h6. But what doesn't work here is this, which is very hard to find, bishop to b5. And you can sit here and stare at the board and you will still have trouble knowing what to do. Why? Because this is some heck of a position. Can we take the knight and pin the queen? I need takers here to confirm. Sure we can, but if you now just queen, king e7 will have the rook removed. And once you grab the queen, once you recapture, okay, the bishop will fall on b5. But even here, you don't need to capture this knight. And there is a reason for this. A queen check on g7 is going to push the king back to the 8th rank. And when you now take this knight, there is no way black can escape. It's two rooks versus a bishop and a knight. And that will be enough. Coming back, Levon went for this rook move just to be able to attack the king. This knight move to g5 was one carefully selected jump. But this did not stop what Levon had planned. He came in with a queen promotion. And when the bishop took, the queen came in with a check. When the king got out to f7, Levon could have taken the knight, but chose to go for another check. And when the king returned to g8, what if Levon went for this rook move? Well, let's not worry about this because this is exactly how Levon played it. Wherever the queen goes, is not going to do it. Grishuk returned the queen to f7, and even the very best can get it wrong here. If you take the bishop with a check, after the king escapes to h7, the queen can easily return to eliminate c5, and though the position is not very clear, let's continue. An attack on the queen can lead to the queen to pin this knight. And even if you remove the bishop on e3, once you take the knight, when the queens come off, white is not up, but up by some margin. And this is what Aronian is still kicking himself about. He was livid when he saw this continuation. Coming back, how did he go about it? He came in with a check without taking the bishop. And once the queen returned, he could still have taken the knight. He wanted to do this, but what he did first was to remove f4. And we do have a problem here because when the knight returned to attack the queen, okay, the knight was pinned, but nothing stopped the queens from coming off. They did it in the end. And when the king came out to h7, it was the turn of the rooks to come off. So when the rooks came off, do you see this bishop on f4? Well, he's under attack. So it is either him moving out or the alternative is to just eliminate the knight. Levon kept him on the board and repositioned him here to d6. And now if the bishop is in time to take this knight, c5 would be history. If we stop for a quick evaluation, we have both the pair of bishops and the pair of knights against the rook. Oh, there was a knight here on f1 before I forget to count him in. So far the knight stays here. This is fine because he neutralizes the rook. So this rook right now is pretty harmless. Of course, you can go for g2 and then get him out provided you find the time. Who's better right now? I really don't know. With these bishops being all over the place, it's like there are missiles. Look at the long range capability. Don't you call them ballistic? Or let's use something more strong, intercontinental ballistic missiles. That is what they are. Adding to the equation these three knights, what a complex game this is. Taking c5 may lead to disaster because b5 
before you go for the obvious attack, and I will explain, if you first attack this bishop, dropping the bishop back to e3 is going to bring this knight with his very heavy blow, and there goes white for sure. So if we come back, Aronian did in fact come up with the rook move because it also protects this guy here on b2. And since it also covers h2, the knight is free to move out. Knight e4, got the bishop to attack a7, and now just see how Grichuk does it. He came up with this excellent bishop move to d4 and doesn't care if a7 drops. Levon attacked the knight, and when he landed on e5, even here there are so many intricate ways to deal with this situation. One possible way is to give up your bishop for the knight. And once the bishop recaptures, the bishop on c4 can be used as a leverage to get the rook out to the back rank. Another possible way is what Grishuk did. He got the bishop out of danger, which also attacks the knight. And when the knight came in with a check, just look at the power of the black pieces surrounding the white king. King e2 could have dropped b2, and yet Grichuk didn't risk it. He preferred to come in with another check. And when the king moved back to d1, the knight returned to d3. And now, knight d2 to challenge the knight on e4 to take. Grichuk didn't. He pulled him back to f6, and that was the bishop in danger. Levon got him out of harm's way, and after 42 moves of some fantastic yet complicated, very complicated game, the two agreed to share the points between them. Having gone through this game, we saw some very interesting positions. Okay, Aronian is kicking himself because he could have done with a win here, because he was landed with the opportunity and yet he missed his chances. Grishigan's turn was also very resilient, and if you look at the moves these two fished out in this game, we can only appreciate them for their entertainment. Grishigan in particular is such a witty character. I love the way he cracks his jokes. Okay, Grishigan lost his very first game against Kramnik, then he won Wesley in round two. In round three, he drew against Kayakin. And then he drew again in round four against our dark horse, Ding Liren. A Ding Liren who is following the steps of Anishgiri. Yep, six games, six draws. And just wait one or two years and this guy is going to go for gold. Okie dokie, what awaits in round seven? Grichuk meets one of the two leaders, Mamidiarov. Kramnik is up against the dark horse. Sergei meets Wesley and the remaining two... Alevon and our other leader, Fabi, who's on top of his game. Six games, no losses, and two wins. One against Wesley in round one, and another against Kramnik in round four. And I'm happy to have gotten this game between Aronin and Grichuk out of the way, because it was an absolute beauty from start to end. And I nearly forgot, because I wanted to mention it, and yet I didn't. If you go back to White's third move, that F3 Levon went for, this is what people call the anti-Grunfeld, a weapon Aronian used to sabotage Grichuk's choice of opening. Okay, I shall be back for more, but I also wanted to remind everyone who's watching, do not forget, because right now there is another competition which is far stronger than the candidates, the Top Chess Engine Championship, which puts to shame even our very best chess players. I have neglected these games to cover the candidates, but I do really need to cover some very important games here too. So until next time, this was your Chess Puzzler.